All right, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Music with the Maestro. I'm Anthony Blake Clark, the music director of Baltimore Choral Arts, and this week we have a real privilege. Uh, we get to talk to Patrick Dupre Quigley, who is the artistic director of Seraphic Fire. Hello, Patrick. How's it going? Hey, Blake. How are you? I'm doing well. We're uh, really excited to talk with you today. And um, for those of you who don't know his work, you should go. Um, check out as many Seraphic Fire YouTube videos as you can. On They're really great. Uh, Patrick has become a really good friend of mine over the past three years since I moved to Washington. And uh, he's just been an incredible sounding board when I needed to, to talk about uh, professional issues. And um, he's been a, a, a great friend and colleague. So excited to talk to you today about Mozart Requiem. Um, certainly one of my favorite pieces. And actually, we were supposed to perform uh, the Mozart along with the first horn concerto and Britain serenade for tenor horn and strings uh, two days ago. And of course, oh, we, wow. didn't, oh, we didn't do that. So uh, Stephen Soph was going to sing the, the tenor on the Britain and we were going to have a lovely Mozart Requiem, but didn't happen. So this is the next best thing, getting to talk to Patrick about Mozart. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's the next best thing, but <laughs> a substitute. <laughs> yeah, a, a worthy substitute. So, you know, we're all in a unique situation in the whole world, of course. This is an unprecedented time, but, you know, our, our ensembles, Seraphic Fire and Baltimore Choral Arts and everything else we're doing, we can't get together right now. Um, and you and I can't really do anything without our musicians, right, as conductors. So. What have you been doing during this time to get yourself through um, and, and to continue thinking about music and, and uh, what have you been up to? Sure, um, for the past two months, uh, we have been focused both on uh, when, when you're working with musicians who come from around the country, uh, it's almost as hard to cancel a con set of concerts than it is to put one on. And so uh, we have actually had to cancel so far, 15 concerts, uh, as Ooh. well as another eight to 10 education services, our first, uh, our first high school workshop. And so uh, the first couple of weeks was taking care of that and figuring out uh, how do we do that in a way that is respectful to everyone involved, including our musicians and our audience members. Uh, and then after that, we just are currently in the process of answering what's next. And so, uh, in the interim, uh, once people who are smarter than me figure out how uh, this is gone, uh, we'll be back to performing live. But in the interim, we are working on a number of different digital projects. Uh, we released our first podcast a few weeks ago, and we'll be doing that monthly. Uh, we've had a number of premier uh, premier performances by our uh, by our Ceravic Fire musicians, which have been posted on Ceravic Fire webpage and elsewhere. Uh, our, our, uh, our artistic core put together a really remarkable set of videos uh, for, uh, for Facebook and Instagram on music for male voices. Uh, we were supposed to be performing a program uh, of music for men's voices uh, last week, and uh, that was unable to happen, but we were able to sort of talk about uh, the, the various uh, things that go around music for men's voices. Uh, right now, we are working on some projects internally and externally about uh, workplace safety for uh, for musicians and for audiences, uh, as well as how do we translate our in-person education programs to an audience that is no longer allowed to be in person. So right. uh, they're deep questions and we haven't solved most of them yet, but uh, we're, you know, I think that most of our lives are sort of uh, directed toward that at the moment. Uh, right. More than anything, we're waiting. I, I think that you probably know art is a reaction at all times and we're just really waiting for something to react to. Uh, Absolutely. So, and we're going to sit tight and do what we can in the meantime. Sure. Well, you alluded to this already, but but what are um, some ways and, and where, are some, where is some content that we can check out right now uh, from Seraphic Fire to tide us over until we can have an in-person concert experience again? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, you could start out by going to YouTube and checking out the Seraphic Fire YouTube channel. Yeah. We also have, I think, all of our recordings, except for perhaps the first three are on uh, are on Spotify and yeah. Apple Music. 
Uh, our website is a wonderful place for some uh, for both media and uh, keeping in touch with what we're doing. Our podcast is based off of our website, but you can listen to it either uh, either by going to Apple Podcasts or searching anywhere on the web. Uh, it's available. It's sort of universally available right now. And that's what you um, just launched, right? Yes, yeah. uh, we launched that uh, two weekends ago. Great. So, yeah. Perfect. Uh, well, we'll all check that out. Thank you. So we're here really to talk about Mozart Requiem. So you've conducted this a lot. Um, do you have one or two favorite performances? Yes, uh, I have many. I mean, it's hard not to think of Mozart Requiem and perform it and have that performance not be a favorite performance. You sort of have to work at it. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. Um, I can think of a few, uh, a few really, uh, really personally touching moments. Uh, I remember the we we were able to perform this uh, in a completion that we had commissioned, uh, mm. a contemporary completion uh, by the composer J Greg Spears. We were able to perform that both sort of up and down the East Coast, starting in Miami and wake, working our way through. DC, Philadelphia, and New York. Um, and that was a pretty incredible tour with some great colleagues, uh, both in Seraphic Fire and in the period orchestra, the Sebastians. Yeah. Uh, I also had um, the great honor to be able to lead the Cleveland Orchestra and chorus in this uh, in Severance Hall a couple years ago as part of their Summers at Severance program. And um, it's to that is a remarkably humbling thing to be in front of those forces and uh, to hear that music echo off of the walls of Severance Hall. It's a, uh, it's it was a, it was a singular music making moment, and I am eternally grateful that I've had the opportunity to do that. Well, here's to more. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you know the work, as you know, uh, shrouded in intrigue and and only helped in recent years by the mystery that has been injected into the story of Mozart's final moments by the play and in the film Amadeus. But you know, even at, that, at the time of Mozart's death in 1791, there were, the rumor mill was already churning swiftly. I mean, Constanza helped foster interest of, uh, in the Requiem with maybe some fanciful tales of Mozart's foreboding manner <laughs> while writing the Requiem Mass, and, and you know, which would end up, of course, being his final work, which is very poetic. And uh, of course, the most, you know, poetic truth about all of this is that it, the Requiem was his final piece, and it's such a tragic and beautiful thing that he died while writing a funeral mass. Um, and it's it's sort of fueled many fires over the centuries um, uh, for us to be interested in it. So, given all this, do you have any premonitions as to you know what is true about the circumstances of the Requiem fragments that Mozart was able to put to paper before he died? Sure. I mean, I think that the truth is probably a little less glamorous and cinematic, yeah. but no less interesting. Uh, Mozart got this commission anonymously at the first part of 1791. Um, he received it. He was interested in it because at the time and over the course of that year, uh, according to some sources, he was he was sort of angling to uh, succeed uh, the music director at St. Stephen's in, in Vienna. Uh, and for him, he had been out of the church music business for probably 15 years or so at that point. Um, he had sort of left his, uh, as he would think of sort of his less uh, cosmopolitan roots of Salzburg behind and he went to Vienna where uh, he made a career for himself mostly in uh, non-sacred music, particularly in the realm of opera. Uh, he got the, the commission from Baron von, Vel von Valsig uh, in, I think it was February of 1791, but he didn't begin really working on it until he completed Magic Flute. Mm -hmm. And so this is October of 1791. So he doesn't even really begin to put some heavy work into this score until two months before his death. Um, at that point, uh, he was not aware of, or we think he was not aware of the eventual person who would take control of this. And so he writes a requiem that is less for a person than it is for him honoring his musical predecessors, as we see in the first and many other movements. Uh, 
at right before his death, he heard bits and pieces of this sung the night before he died. Um, his wife, uh, the original Tamino in Magic Flute, mm -hmm. as well as Zusmeyer and a few other friends, uh, came around his bedside and they uh, they sang this with him or parts of it as much as one can when one is hours away from death. And then he passes away the next day. Uh, the the premiere by Volsic doesn't really happen until 1793, but we have to put that idea of premiere in quotes because it wasn't the first time this was this piece was heard in its entirety or in parts. Uh, it was thought that probably some of this was sung for Mozart's funeral at St. Stephen's a day or two after his death. Uh, at St. Michael's, which was the musician's church in the Berghof, he, uh, he was able, uh, not he, uh, his friends uh, at, the very, at the very end of December were able to put on a small uh, memorial service for him that included the introit, uh, the curie, and perhaps some of the movements of the dies irae and offertory. Uh, the piece actually receives its true premiere uh, a month before Walczak gives his premiere, uh, his anonymous premiere of the work. Right. And, uh, and this is done by Mozart's dear friend and patron of not only Mozart, but of music in general, Baron von Swieten, who is the imperial librarian at the time. Uh, this is the person that introduces Mozart to the music of Bach and Handel, um, and eventually convinces Mozart to uh, prepare musical materials for other Handel works like Alexander's Feast right. and uh, Messiah, Messiah and Asus and Galatea. And uh, he, 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 uh, he is also uh, toward the end of his life. I mean, it's a very short life, but in the last part of his life uh, through the Society of Musicians, which, uh, which claimed as its membership later on, uh, or at the same time, Franz Josef Haydn, later on Beethoven, uh, that these were, uh, that this was a, a, a group of musicians who got together to perform music for the benefit of music and musicians. Uh, and he led a number of the Handel performances uh, in the last six or seven years of his life there. These probably weren't fully, always fully orchestrated performances. Sometimes they were only piano, uh, but it just depended on the circumstances, certainly when they were in salons like Baron von Sweden's, uh, Sweden's salon, uh, they would have been performed with just piano and voices, whereas, uh, as is evidenced by, the, by even parts in Mozart hand, Mozart's hands, that these were, ex we, these, these were not only transcribed, but expanded for performance by uh, the Society of Musicians. So um, it has a really long history. Uh, I think also one of the things that is probably uh, interesting about it is how the composition itself took place and um, who wrote it, uh, where the basis of this comes from, and uh, what is the quote-unquote authenticity of the notes that are on the page. And these are right. some of the yeah. very big questions that uh, I'm sure that you have had to grapple with as you are performing, as you were preparing for your performance. I think every performance requires a level of uh, a level of research and attention to detail, but also a conviction by the music makers that the way that they are doing is a way that they would like to present this piece because so few limits actually exist. Exactly, right, yeah. right. Really interesting. So here's another difficult question for you. There are so many completions by scholars and conductors, um, Mozart specialists, because of course, you know, it was left unfinished. Um, which do you prefer? What is your completion? Uh, I think that they all have really magnificent things about them. I think if we want to talk about the historic nature of this piece of music, then we should probably think of it not so much as a piece of Mozart's, but rather a piece that was constructed and given its musical impetus by Mozart and completed by the studio of musicians who who supported him for years and years as part of his musical establishment. Right. Zussmeyer worked with Mozart as a copyist on a number of pieces. He worked very closely with him on Magic Flute, um, as did a number of the other hands that were involved in, in completing this, the first version of this piece. 
Uh, and so personally, I think that there is, there is some, there's very great value in uh, performing this music with, uh, that was completed by hands who knew Mozart and not only knew Mozart's style because they copied it or finished things for him or expanded orchestration, but uh, they also knew Mozart's handwriting. Uh, when, when Zussmeyer was asked to complete this by Costanza, he's not the first person to be asked, but the one who actually did the completion, uh, you know, he also tried as much as possible to write in the same style that Mozart did in terms of his handwriting. Zussmeyer's handwriting was, was different and had, a, had some very significant characteristics about it. He, he, he put that, he sort of put that underneath the, underneath the table and decided to take on the, at least in handwriting, the personality of Mozart. And I think certainly musically, he did what he could to be faithful to the person who had written this and was a dear friend and colleague as well. Right. Interesting. It's really fascinating to, to imagine um, all the possibilities that are, yeah. that are here. So, yes. okay, let's talk about some key moments of the Requiem and then, um, and then we'll listen to them. So we're starting at the very beginning with the introit. I'm always really struck every time I rehearse this beginning, how deeply solemn it is, right? We've got like these shuffling of feet down the aisle of the church in the bass register of the orchestra and then the, these wonderful contrapuntal suspensions with the bassoon and the basset horns and it's so sorrowful and subdued and kind of anguished moaning and then of course you know you let out the intense cries and anger from the brass and the choir comes in so so you take over tell tell us what we should be listening for in the introit as we're as we're getting ready to listen to it I think the introit, which is the only movement that we have where everything, basically everything was written by Mozart. Uh, right. The Kyrie, similarly, but the orchestration of, uh, of, the various, uh, of the various parts, Cola Parte, with the voices, was done by another person. So mm -hmm. if we look to what we think that perhaps Mozart had in mind, um, the beginning of this piece is... If anything, it is homage to um, to the people who were influential on his life and his musical life, both people who had passed away and people who were still alive at the time. And so, the bass line of this piece, "Diam uh, Bam Dam," this actually comes from a piece of Handel. Uh, it it comes from uh, funeral anthem. Fun the funeral anthem for Queen Caroline. Right. Uh, you know, and my, my coffee is just kicking in. <laughs> uh, but over it, he begins even from the even from the second eighth note. He begins to layer sort of Viennese classicism over German slash English Baroque, and so mm -hmm. uh, Italianate German English Baroque. Right. And so uh, we begin by hearing, um, you know. In, in Handel's work, it's single notes, Diam, bum, bum. but Mozart changes into that, changes it into that almost, that very solemn Viennese funereal umpa. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, and over it, so this is, we're already now, we've taken a piece of a, a bass line, which was the, you know, the, the, the basis of Baroque music. Um, and he begins to do his own improvisation on top of it with the with the with the string accompaniment, and then a beat later, the the bassoon comes in with uh, with another motive, which also uh, brings to mind the music of uh, of the funeral motet for King for Queen Carol for Queen Caroline. Yeah. Um, the uh, the uh, but presents it in four voices which have a really, really um, specific vocal and timbral character. Um, he used basset horns a number of times in his compositions, but the two places that are most, uh, that, we, we, that, that are most prominent are in, uh, both in the, the, the the Masonic funeral music, as well as in Magic Flute, which he had just written. So right. it, these 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 instruments, to him at least, had some sort of uh, funereal uh, funereal association and Masonic association. 
Uh, and so we get a quartet of almost Palestrina-esque yeah. uh, counterpoint that's going on over a Baroque bass line that is modified by uh, a Viennese late 18th century classical composer. And so already we have something that is uh, on that is at, that is firing on different levels at the same time. Three bars, excuse me, three beats before the the voices come in, uh, we get uh, we get this loud sort of interruption by the trombones, which have also been uh, a, a a funeral instrument for a long time and an instrument of the underworld. Uh, we often hear it uh, in Mozart's uh, in Mozart's music at times of great uh, times of great solemnity or um, you know, it's 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 featured prominently in Magic Flute and in uh, and in Don Giovanni. Uh, we hear the we hear the the trombone choir act in a similar way. Right. Um, and then the voices come in and they bring us that uh, they bring us that marvelous counterpoint, uh, almost in a the, the sort of Palestrina esque counterpoint that was begun in the reeded instruments in the first and second measures. Uh, and they begin to sing this in uh, in similarly in a slow counterpoint, which leads us to eventually becoming homophonic at the words et lux perpetua, at perpetual light, at which point uh, Mozart brings in another quote by, this is, he's quoting music, uh, he's quoting rhythm and the homophony directly from the Michael Haydn C minor record. Right, exactly, yeah. Which Which he would have sung as a, as a child in Salzburg. Uh, yeah, I don't know if he would have sung it. He, the premiere of that work was when Mozart was 16. Oh, okay. And so he had, he had just arrived, you know, when he was six, he went on, he went on this grand tour right. to see with his father and his sister to see if he could gather any patronage. His sister basically got off the performance uh, train, but he stayed on it. Um, and this this is a funeral. Uh, this this piece was written for for uh, upon the death of the archbishop that preceded Mozart's boss, and it was written by Michael Haydn, who was uh, who was a member of the musical staff. Uh, of 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 the Salzburg court prior to Mozart's coming and after Mozart's and after, leaving. Right. Uh, and this probably would have been in the repertoire of the of the Salzburg Cathedral at this point. Um, it clearly made a very large impression on the 16-year-old Mo Mozart. He heard the first three performances of this work with his father when he came back off of the when he came back off of the road from touring. And a year and a half, two years later, he would be part of this musical establishment, which was helmed by Michael Haydn. Um, and so we hear this, um, you know, only 30 seconds, 45 seconds into the piece, we get the first Michael Haydn quote, and then we transition into the psalm that is that would have been sung in between the in between the in between the the various uh, of the introit. So. Um, and and he quotes the tonus peregrinus, one of the psalm chanting tones that would have been just part of daily life in church music, uh, Catholic church music at the time. Uh, Michael Haydn does the same thing, though with a different church music tone on the same on the same uh, on the same text. So right. in E flat major, we get uh, we get Michael Haydn uh, using tone one in in sort of the unison chorus, da 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 right. So be that whereas in Mozart, he intones it with a single soprano voice. It's um it's high and is then echoed by the soprano lines. And then we come back and get a and we sort of get a we get a recap of what happened before. Um, I think when we see this uh, when we see this first movement we hear it as an overwhelming piece of music because so much of what has been extrapolated by other composers is taken from this first movement. And so in a, in a 21st century hearing of this, particularly as it's one of the most played pieces of Western art music that we know of, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it sets us up motivically in the way that a first movement of a romantic symphony would set us up. And this is, you know, 
quite long before we're getting to the motivic complexity of Wagner or Mahler. Um, and we see that same attention to motivic complexity in this mm -hmm. first movement, and that is extrapolated by the people who came after him, Zussmeyer and others, in order to fill out the parts of the rest of, of, of this work. Right. Great. Let's, uh, let's have our audience take a listen to the intro right now.
The next large section that we get to is the DSE ray. Uh, the DSE ray, while often in common parlance, we refer to the first movement of the DSE ray that has the initial words DSE ray as the DSE ray. The DSE ray is actually a multi movement work that takes a Gregorian chant sequence, the text of it, as a uh, as its basis, which talks about the day of that talks about the day of judgment and the different things that might happen to people and what we would be desiring during that day of judgment. Uh, the first movement is very well was was very uh, solidly put forth by Mozart and his ideas. And as we go through the Dies Irae, we get less and less of Mozart's hand. And I, the two movements of the Dies Irae that I think that perhaps we should talk about are um, the second movement of the Dies Irae, the Tuba Mirum, and the last movement, which is the Lacrimosa. Great. Tuba Mirum Sargent so. And so across the entirety of the large Dies Irae, the multi-move, the multi-movement work Dies Irae, Mozart takes the idea of four voices, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, both in chorus and in solo, and shows what a person could do with those forces in the course of a requiem text. And number, the second movement, the tuba mirum, is particularly interesting because it has all of the elements of sacred music while also having many of the elements of either concerted concert music or probably more likely um, operatic music and, and the treatment of the operatic, uh, of, of the operatic ensemble of soloists. Right. Um, this was a particularly, uh, this was a particular forte of Mozart's. If we think of uh, sets of music that are gathered together in his operas, some of the greatest, uh, greatest moments in his operas and perhaps in all of music are written as ataka movements for small ensembles that lead to solos, that lead to larger ensembles, that lead to smaller ensembles, that lead to duets, trios, and finally everyone comes in at the end. Mm -hmm. Think about the second act finale of The Marriage of Figaro, which I personally think is perhaps my favorite moment in all of music. Wow. Um, and you think about how he manipulates key and texture and orchestration. He does the exact same thing in the DSC ray. The first movement is full of thunder and lightning and drums and trumpets. Um, and then we move to the tuba mirum, which is the first point in which we get all four of the vocal soloists um, who, who establish their character right away. Right. Um, I, one of the things that like when, I, when I'm taking a, look at this movement, there are many, many, many different ways that people over time have interpreted and recorded this. Um, one of the big questions about this is what's the tempo? And Mozart writes andante. I mean, this is, this is a Mozart, uh, he is the one telling us. Um, and often people will take this in a slow four. However, we have to look at the score and realize that in Mozart's handwriting, this is written in a la breve or cut C, mm -hmm. C with the line through it. And so is the, is the andante to the, is the andante to the half note or is the andante or to the quarter, to the quarter note? note? I personally think that it's to the half note. Uh, and as a result, it gives the, it gives this movement of the work a certain, um, uh, Italianate Viennese opera character about sure. it. Um, we we initially have the trombone, which is a, a it's a it's a in the translation of uh, of the Dies Irae into German, uh, the tuba mirum that tuba um, is uh, is is thought of as the posauna, the 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 the, uh, the trombone instead in of the trumpet, right? Instead of the trumpet, yes. And so uh, it starts out with a very declamatory 
arpeggio in the in the trombone, which is echoed in the bass, and the bass sings it. Um, it the the bass line echoes perhaps the same harmonic language as the commendatore in, um, in, in Don Giovanni, speaking initially only in great leaps and then held notes. But then we, the, from the moment that the, that the, the bass lines out its, uh, its, his, uh, his music, we then get the trombone who, instead of being this sort of very pompous beginning, then begins to explore all the different key areas that could be part of uh, a, a B flat pedal, mm -hmm. um, which then ends up with the bass having a little fermata, two of them actually, one over the first note when it resolves to only a bass cadence, and then uh, another fermata at the end after a slight uh, little turn that's in the music. And I think that probably at this point, um, if this was an opera, the bass would have added a little bit of a cadenza here. Um, and so I think that this is a slight bit of humor amidst all of this terror that we get Mozart saying, all right, let's be theatrical now. Right. And so there's this wonderful duet back and forth between the the trombone and, and the bass. The trombone is the only part of this that Mozart wrote in the accompaniment. Um, there are a few moments later on the piece where he, 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 he lets us know what he wanted for the, uh, for the violin line, the top violin line, but the trombone comes in and then we don't see it in Mozart's hand again after the tenor, uh, after the tenor. More enter. stupid beat, yeah. More I, stupid I, th beat. I think it's really interesting that the, that the trombone all of a sudden becomes uh, a, a contributor of an immense amount of filigree. I mean, it's just, it kind of dances around this very resolute bass line uh, from the singer and you almost feel as if it should be switched around. Um, yes. And I think that's really fascinating. Yeah, and, and you know, when, when Mozart was writing his, uh, writing his operas, he was writing for specific people and their talents. In this, this is an anonymous, a, a anonymous commission that he's gonna hand off. He doesn't know who is going to be the soloist in this. And so he writes for uh, certain characters of voices. And so the, the, the basso in, uh, in this is, is sort of half commendatory, half uh, sort of buffo uh, as, the, as it interacts back and forth with this, Somewhat uh, uh, chromatically infe inflected uh, moment in the in the uh, in the trombone at first. Um, they uh, they have a really nice interplay, which is then uh, interrupted by a heroic tenor. Uh, perhaps it's Tamino, perhaps it's Donatario, but uh, instantly we are taken into a different uh, a different place, particularly in what he. Uh, in what he indicates in the basso continuo line. So we get eighth notes, it's a forte piano, so we get a surprise, something new, and right. a really, really um, cantabile line for the, for, the, uh, for the tenor. It's sung through almost all the way through. It's not very angular. It's mostly stepwise. There are a number of appoggiator figures and slurs for the voice that give us a much different character. Um, out of that, uh, we get uh, we we then arrive at the mezzo soloist, who is a, could be Marcellina from the uh, from uh, from uh, from uh, Don, uh, excuse me from Marriage of Figaro, um, or any of the other sort of. Uh, proclamatory, dr either dramatic soprano or um, sort of scoldy mezzo soprano roles that uh, that Mozart has written, um, and so the the mezzo acts sort of as Cassandra in this moment, sort of telling us what's going to happen, and then the soprano enters, and we have this this musical enter uh, this musical innocence that comes in with the soprano. Um, it's almost as if Susanna has walked into a room that has the Count, Basilio, and uh, and uh, e even from a from like a perhaps even a, a, a Castrati in the in in the alto role, and she comes in and changes the character. We get out of the we get out of a major place slowly, and then uh, in, 
we, sorry, we get out of a minor key area, move a little bit more toward a major tonality. Right. Um, and, then, and then all four voices join together in homophony, uh, which presages future movements. But this is sort of the opening of the scene for the soloists, in a way. And there were two more major solo moments that were to be composed uh, later. One of them gets composed by Mozart, and one of them gets composed by Zussmeier. Um, and so this was probably, I, I, as knowing other pieces that and conducted and sung and played, other pieces that Mozart wrote, um, this feels like an opening movement uh, of a three movement that will be resolved in the slow movement of the Recordare, and then what would have been resolved in the Benedictus uh, of the Sanctus, which he, which Mozart doesn't get to write at all. Right. Quick, not a part of it, it's in the 